Yeah, holy, holy, holy. All right, good. Good, good. You guys doing all right today? Everything's copacetic with you? Everybody, I'm, I know I'm going to move the crystal stand because I guarantee I'm going to run over that thing. I, I can, uh, that thing wouldn't have a snowball's chance right there. Is all I'm telling you. <laughs> I was already run over. Oh, bless the Lord. All right, guys, you know what we're dealing with today, right? We started last week in dealing with um, eight great uh, statements in, in, about how to be happy in life. Anybody here interested in being happy in life? <laughs> I mean, would that be something that would be important to you, the, how to be happy? Well, I know Jesus knows that it is. And so that's why he started what is uh, considered to be his greatest sermon. The Sermon on the Mount, that is considered by theologians and, and commentators and, 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 and Christians and people, that it's considered to be the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached. And it covers three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. And it, and it, and it, it tells us all of the, um, all of the, 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 about the kingdom of God and what it's about and what our privileges are in the kingdom of God. It's like a constitution for the kingdom of God. You know, our country has a constitution, and our constitution limits what the government can do, really, and it controls our government against us. Well, the constitution of the kingdom of God, Jesus says these are the principles of the kingdom of God and what you as a citizen of the kingdom of God can expect from God and what God expects from you. And the first 12 verses of this Sermon on the Mount is called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes just simply mean these are the, in these first 12 verses, are the attitudes that you're supposed to have as part of the kingdom of God. And if you'll have these attitudes, your life will be happy. And I think it's just really interesting that, of all, that out of all of the subjects Jesus could have talked about, as the opening of, uh, of the constitution of the kingdom of God and his greatest sermon, just think about all the different things he could have talked about. He chooses to talk about how to be happy. And why would he do this? Because he knows that everybody wants to be happy in life. And all of us would look for happiness in all the wrong places. You don't have to say amen to that. But I know it's true, and I know I've done it, and you've done it, and we've done it, and, and we'll even continue to do it unless somehow the Lord convinces us that where you look and where you're looking is not going to bring you happiness, but these attitudes will bring you happiness. And I'm just telling you this because I don't want you to waste all of your life searching for happiness in all the wrong places which you will, not because you're weak, but because you're human. And humans have certain propensities in life and qualities in life, and we're drawn by certain things in life, and we'll just repeat it over and over and over and over uh, as if, you know, the definition of insanity is what? To continue to do the same thing and expect different results, <laughs> Right. Well then, we do, but we do that all the time. We, you know, we just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over, and then we get all upset because we don't have a different result. You know, you do the same thing, you're going to have the same result. And so God said, "All right, here are eight ways, here are eight attitudes that will change your life, and you could be different in life." How many of you? How many of you remember your first broken heart? Has, have you ever had your heart broken? I can remember my first broken heart. It happened to me when I was in the fifth grade. Um, it was a girl by the name of Debbie. And I, I can't really remember her last name, honestly. I tried to remember. I said, what was her last name? I couldn't remember. But anyway, I was in the fifth grade, and she dumped me, you know. Um, imagine that. <laughs> Dumping the most wonderful person in the world. <laughs> I can't, but that was her loss is all I can tell you. But, but uh, 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 wouldn't it be nice if all of the heartbreaks in life were as easy to get over as the kind you had when you were in the fifth grade, <laughs> right? Don't you wish all of them were like that? But the fact is, as we grow older, um, the heartbreaks in life um, get 
get harder and, and, and we experience much worse heartaches in life. And it's interesting that the Bible never tries to explain suffering. You notice this? And God never answers the why question. Have you ever asked God the why question? God, why is this happening to me? Uh, we, all, we, answer that, we ask that why question all the time. H have you ever gotten an answer from God about why? No, God doesn't answer the why questions in life, right? The Bible doesn't answer the why questions in life. The Bible just teaches us how to handle these issues. It doesn't tell us why we're going through it or why it happened to us. All it says is, this is how you deal with it. This is how you, 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 you grow from it. This is how it affects your life, and it can, you can be better out of this than you ever would have been if you never had it happen in your life. And here's some verses. These are the beginning first four verses of Matthew chapter 5, which is where we are in seeing the multitudes. He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught his disciples, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We talked about that last week. Blessed are those who recognize their need for God, which this uh, translates into blessed are the humble. Uh, truly humble people are a blessing in life, and God uses that, and God blesses them for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And now in the second one, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God makes a promise about uh, those of us who truly mourn in life. You remember the word blessed up here is the word mak makarios, which means happy. So happy are you when you Pentheo, which is the word used for mourn, happy are you when you are deeply hurt. Happy are you when, when you have true grief in your life. I mean, this is, when, when it talks about mourning, pentheo is not a word that means I, I got a little sad. Pentheo means this is, this is something really deep. This is deep hurt, deep loss. This is, this is grieving over something. This is, this, this is something deep inside of you. So, so Jesus is saying, uh, you can be happy when something has deeply affected your life and the way you're going to be happy. How are, how are you going to be happy after this deep loss, this deep grief, this broken heart? Well, according to the verse, you're going to be happy because you're going to be able to receive the comfort of God. That when you get this way, when you're deeply mourning and deep in grief, deep in heartbreak, deep in hurt, when you wail out to God, that God's going to do something. God's going to bring comfort to your life. So how's God going to do that? How, 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 do you, how do you receive the comfort of God, right? That, that really becomes the big question. If God's going to, I'm in mourning. Any, any of you ever been in mourning about something? I mean, you've had some heartbreaks, you've had some losses, you've had some yeah. things that have just yeah. caused a deep grief within you that you wail out to God. Some things in your past, some things present, <laughs> something you never got over, and it happened 40 years ago, and it, it's still a hole right in the middle of your heart. And every time you think about it, you just, whoo, it just knocks you down and brings you down. And, and inside of you, you just wail out to God, and you have deep grief in your life. And Jesus said, I got good news for you. You can be happy when that happens to you because God is going to do something about that. God is going to relieve that discomfort. So all you have to do is receive the comfort of the Lord. And then you go, the next question is, how, how, how would I do that? How, how, how would I receive the comfort of the Lord? Well, uh, in your notes and up here, and what I have for you is I got uh, basically three simple steps. Now, I'm a I'm preacher. Preachers usually have three steps to everything, right. or three points to everything. Right. You know, three points, a poem, and a deathbed story. That's pretty much what, that's how you build a message, you know. <laughs> but uh, we'll skip the, the poem and the deathbed story, but we do have three points about how to receive, how do you go about receiving from the Lord. And here's the first step. The first step is I realize 
that God is with me. Now, I know that kind of sounds a little simplistic. I know that sounds like, oh, pastor, what kind of craziness? Uh, I don't even need to realize that God is with me. I, I know God's with me. Well, I know that you know this, and you usually will experience this, and you usually will claim this, but when something deeply hurt, hurting happens, you, you and I have a tendency to forget where God is. We, we, when something deeply hurts us, we, we, we all of a sudden begin to think about God as being distant, you know? God, where are you? God, I mean, I'm down here dying. I'm hurting in this. Are you anywhere up there? And you start feeling like God is distant and you're encouraged by the, by the enemy to not see God and not think about God. Or, or, he's too busy. He doesn't care about you. And you start getting all these kind of concepts floating around. And may I say that that is perfectly human to do that. And that even King David, who the Bible calls a man after God's own heart, David felt that way when he felt all, in all of the trouble he was in. And so the Lord inspired David in a psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 34, look at it. The righteous cry out. Everybody say, that's me. Yeah. yeah, that's me. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. And he delivers them from all of their troubles. Yeah. Hey, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Hey, not far away. The Lord comes close. When your heart breaks, that's when he really zooms in on you and closes in on you, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so the Lord is close to you. That's what the Bible says. So instead of feeling like he's distant or he doesn't care or he's way out there somewhere and, and he's just saying, you know, hang on the best you can, the Bible says that, that, no, this is when God comes close to you. So let me, let me, let me give you three things to remember about, about realizing that God is there. And here they are. First fact to remember is God is aware. Yeah, God, God, God knows what's going on. He's watching over you. Job in the Bible, in the book of Job, Job said God keeps a close watch on all of our paths. Job said, man, God knows exactly what's going on, and he watches closely. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, you'll remember this one, I'm sure, that nothing escapes the, the vision of God in our life, that even the very hairs of our head are numbered, right? <laughs> I mean, a God who watches us close enough to know the hairs of our head are numbered, uh, that's close, right? That's paying attention. Now, I know with me, he's trying to make things a little lighter on himself, and I'm you know, I'm, I'm kind of losing. He doesn't have as many to keep track of as he used to. My angel's going, uh, uh, uh. whoa, yeah. No, where did that one go? All right, well, you know, 29, 30, <laughs> like that, yeah. And some of you are laughing, but you, you're losing them too, you know. I mean, you, your angel's going, man, you ain't got nothing to laugh at. What you talking about? <laughs> but anyway, that, that just shows you how close the Word of God uh, says God pays attention. And when, you, and, and when you're hurting, you, you have a feeling on the inside of you that nobody knows how I feel. Nobody, I mean, I'm in this all by myself and that nobody, nobody's aware of what's going on and nobody knows how I feel. But, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we did a, a, a passage out of Hebrews 4 that these verses were in, like verse 15, look at what it says. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the Bible says, look, you, you, God knows how you feel. Jesus has been through everything that you experienced, and he experienced it with you, so you cannot truly say, no one understands how I feel you, Jesus understands how you feel because the Bible says that he went through it. So God not, not only knows and is aware of what's going on in your life, God also cares what, for what's going on in your life. Look, look, at, look at verse, uh, verse 16. It goes on to say that, 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 that we have a high priest and he knows how we feel because he's been touched just like we've been touched. Look at, look at verse 16. Let us therefore... Come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. In other words, we, we, 
We, because God cares, he gives us something to grab onto. And what is it that we can grab onto? Well, we can grab onto a throne of, <laughs> a throne of grace, right? Not a throne of judgment, not, not, not a throne of chastisement, but God is a throne and he said, come boldly under the throne. You know, you know what boldly is? We talked about it. That's not brashly, that's not arrogantly. It means with confidence, come with confidence into the presence of God because you're coming to a throne, not of judgment, but a throne of grace because a God that cares has established a throne of grace and, 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 it, and, and it's a throne for you and God has prepared it for you. And so if you miss everything else that I say here today, I'd love for you to go away with at least one thought in your mind, and the one thought in your mind that I would like to leave with you is that your pain matters to God. God cares about what's happening with you. He knows what's happening with you. He's not an absentee landlord. He's not some cosmic killjoy that sets things spinning and then walks away and says, do the best you can. God inhabits the praises of his people. God, God is close to us when we're in pain, and he comes even closer when things are spinning out of control and our hearts are broken because I, his, his, our pain matters to him. So God is aware. God cares. There's one more thing to remember when you're hurting. God wants to help you. Yeah, God, God, God says in that last verse that we come to a throne what are you going to do when you get there? You're, you're going to obtain mercy, and you're going to find grace in a time of need. <laughs> My, imagine that. What do you need when you're hurting? I need the grace of God. <laughs> yeah, you do. You need the grace of God. So when you come to the throne of grace, you're going to find grace, and you're going to find mercy. Mercy keeps me from getting what I deserve. Grace gives me what I don't deserve. So according to the word of God, when you're hurting, God is not only aware and he offers assistance to you and he not only cares and wants to help you, uh, when we're in pain, God doesn't just write a note and send it down and say, I'm thinking of you in hurting time. No, he comes with comfort. Yeah, with comfort. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, parakaleo is what the word comfort our English word, uh, 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 comfort, it means God comes with strength. Comfort means, comfort is translated with strength. So when we are in trouble and our hearts are broken and, and, and we're mourning and it's deep within us and we're grieving and we're hurting, uh, the Bible says God is going to comfort you. That is, God is going to bring you strength in life. That's what God's going to do. Now, some people grow in their pain, and some people get stuck in their pain, and they never get out of their pain. Why is that? It's because they never take this next step. Yeah, they, the, the first step is I realize that God is with me, and, I, and that he's aware, and that he cares, and that he wants to help me, but how do you, how do you go ahead and get out of the pain? We got all that realization going on, but, but that's not getting out. That's just getting the basis for knowing what God wants to do and that he's there and confidence in him. I mean, that's not what gets it out of us. What gets it out of us? Well, it's this next step. Uh, step two, I release the hurt. <laughs> How simplistic is that? You say, well, that's easier said than done. Yeah. Sure it is. That's why we don't do it, because it's really a lot harder <laughs> than, it, than, it, than it seemed. Well, how do you do it? How do, how do, how do you release something to God? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how you start. Here's how you start. You start with a, with, with, with a, with a wisdom in yourself, and, and here, here it is. You stop focusing on what is lost. And you start focusing on what is left. Let me say it again to you. How do you get out? How do you release? How do you lay it down before God? You know, somebody says, man, take it to the altar and leave it there. 
How do you do that? That's what, that's what letting it go means. That's what getting it out. I, I release it. I let it go. How do, how, do, how do I do that? Well, first thing is, I mean, it's going to happen up here now and right here. You're going to let it go right here and right here. And, and it's going to be an act of your will. It, 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 really, it's a decision. It's, it's a choice that you make. It's not magic. It's not that somebody walks up with a rag and just erases it out of you like that. Oh, no, 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 no. No, oh, it's an act of your will. It is a choice of your soul in life. A conscious choice or an aware choice. Yeah. And the way you start is to stop focusing on what you lost and start focusing on what's left in life. Look at Isaiah 43. We say it every week. It's our vision statement. It's our commissioning verse from God. Look what it says. Look at the, look at the first four words. Huh? How about those? But forget all that. Right? I mean, right off the bat, what would God say? You're in Freedom River Church. Well, what is Freedom River Church and what does it stand for? Well, God said, when we first started this church, God said to us, which this church was born out of great, great pain, deep yeah. pain, yeah. pain I'm still trying to get over. Yeah. 12 years ago, and I'm still trying to, you know, get it out. Yeah, but, it, but, but it is getting out, you know, <laughs> Because God is blessing, I mean, it, but, 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 but the first word he said to us, I mean, I'm, I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmities. I know how it, it feels too, I'm guaranteeing. And, and I know it's a long-term deal sometimes. If you get hurt, it depends on how deep it is. That person that said they loved you and they didn't love you. That person that said, I'll be with you forever. And all they did is stab you in the back and try to take things and burn your reputation and blow up things in life. I mean, my goodness, how, I mean, I've never, I, I know how it is to be stabbed in the back by somebody who said certain things and were supposed to be friends and loyal and into all of that kind of stuff. Thank God, not my mate, you know, thank God it wasn't the one that was the closest to me. I can't imagine how some of you feel about that. That is the deepest kind of deal I can even think of. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I mean, that's deep, deep stuff. Whew, I don't know. I mean, I'd probably still be trying to get over that myself. But you can. And the verse, and the verse that we say every week, but forget all that. You start with forgetting all, all of that. What is that. What is that saying then? It's saying to us, your past is past. That's right. Let it go. Let your past go. But we let people, we let events, we let things from our, uh, from our past con continue to break us. Now that's not God's way. That's not what God wants. They can't. Things from our past, people from our past, hurts from our past can't hurt us. They are past let them go. Yeah. The only way they can hurt us is for us to keep carrying them in our heart. And, 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 and so we can make a choice to let those things go. So you make a choice to hold on to stuff or you make a choice to let those things go. Right. So in letting them go, we have, some, we have some choices in the letting them go. Option number one, instead of letting it go, we can repress it. Now, by repress, I mean we can push it down. We can, we can swallow it, you know. And it, it didn't really happen. I mean, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to get over it. I mean, you just keep trying to, you know, press it down, repress it. But let me, let me tell you what happens if you keep swallowing that stuff. If you swallow it, your stomach is keeping score. Yeah, yeah you think you got rid of it, but no, 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 no. Your stomach is telling you <laughs> that it didn't. So uh, you, you can't swallow hurt or, uh, you know, or pretend that it's not there. Pretend that it doesn't exist. Are you aware how unhealthy that is to just pretend, eh, this never happened, because as long as you hold it in, that it, it just keeps on hurting you and hurting you and hurting you. 
I meet the walking wounded every day, right? You, walk with, you work with the walking wounded. You're sitting by maybe the walking wounded and all of these. And why are these uh, walking wounded? Because they never let things go. They repress it. All that energy, all that adrenaline, all that angst, their blood pressure, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff is just whew, boiling right under the surface. So you can repress it. Uh, second, you can rehearse it. Because some people just do this. They, by rehearsing it, I, I'm talking about you just go over and over it in your mind. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you, you relive it over and over, and, and it just makes you mad and angry again, right? And you're sitting there strategizing about, well, I should have said this, and I should have done that. And I'm telling you, if this ever comes up, I'm going to tell them how I feel. Oh, yeah. Bless God. And, 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 and you're, 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 you have sleepless nights. You, every time you wake up, it's on your mind. When you go to bed, it's, you know, you've had to start taking, uh, you know, Ambien and, uh, and, and, and all those other kind of sleeping aids, all that kind of stuff, because you just keep going over and over and over it in your mind. Well, what does Isaiah 43 say? The first thing God says, forget all that. Isn't that what he said? He said, forget all that. That's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a brand new thing. I'm already doing it. Don't you see it? So you may be arguing, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm mourning. Do you know that there's a big difference between mourning and moaning? Right? There's a big difference. Mourning is legitimate grief. Mourning is what God says if you are legitimately mourning something, it's legitimate grief, you can expect him to come in and to help you get through the grief of life. But if you're moaning, moaning is self-pity. Yeah, moaning is feeling sorry for yourself. Moaning is, is oh me, oh my, poor me. And you just want to hold on to stuff and wallow in it like the martyr that you are, and you love to play the martyr, and oh my God, you love a pity party. As long as it's your pity party and you're the host of it, you love pity parties. Now, we don't love to go to other people's pity parties. Praise the Lord, as soon as I realize I'm in somebody's pity party, the first thing I try to do is uh, excuse myself. <laughs> oh, sorry, brother, I, I, I got to go to the hospital, you know, <laughs> find some reason to get out of there. But we'll hold on to these, those things and, 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 and we'll just never let them go. So you can repress it and you can rehearse it. And here's the worst thing, you can resent it. Now, let me just give you this really quick because uh, we, we could have whole messages about resentment and forgiveness. This is where the rubber meets the road about forgiveness. To resent something means, means to stay angry about it, to, to, to exhibit hate and anger. To resent means I have hate and anger. My, my emotions of hate and anger are involved. And you know, this is the, this is the key. This is the key to uh, letting it go is what happens to this hate and anger. Because I think most of us can verbally or, or logically say, okay, I got to get over this and I can get over this and I've got to get past this in order to begin to heal in my, in my spirit and in my nature. But a lot of people feel like they have trouble with forgiveness. I, maybe even half of you in here, if I ask you, do, do you have something that you haven't forgiven? Is there something inside of you? Did you get hurt by somebody? Did something happen to you and have you forgiven them? And you would say, I'm trying to, or no, I, I hadn't, Pastor. I, I, and, I, and I think the reason you would say that is because uh, you don't really understand what forgiveness means. You have, you have something in your head about what forgiveness really is. And let me just share with you biblically just real quickly what forgiveness means. It, 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 first of all, it, it, it's a conscious thing. It's a... It's a deliberate decision. It's a, it's, a, it's a release of your feelings of hate and anger. 
It was like, I'm thinking about some specific person who did it, somebody who stabbed me, somebody who said they loved me, somebody who was working with me and should have been for me, and they, uh, those little weasels turned it in and backed it over, and that little fraudulent, you know. You see, you, you hear the hate and resentment in my voice? See? And, I'm, and here I am trying to get over it, and I'm still deep. You, you can tell I'm, I'm still mad. I'm still, I'm still hurt in my life, even though I know that I ought to let it go. And I know I have let it go. In my mind, I've said, all right, I'm not going to hold on it. God, forgive them. Forgive me. Let it go. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to try to get vengeance on them. I'm not going to try to, you know, a lot of times we strategize about what we're going to do to them when we get them. You know, we're going to, ooh. I mean, uh, you know, uh, sadly, we humans are at our creative best when we're trying to figure a way to get revenge against somebody, right? I mean, boy, we can think it up. We can say, ooh, boy, I'm going to get them this and this and this. And they'll never know what hit them and more <laughs> Ooh, well, I, 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 I've let that go. I, I'm not trying to get any revenge. I'm not plotting out something. But, but, that, but that emotional part, that, 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 that part in me that still, you know, my emotions that are, that are still hot with anger and, 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 and hate and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, let me just say to you about the emotional part of forgiveness. The emotional part of healing usually takes some time. Huh? I'm telling you that you, it, it may take a long time for that emotional part to catch up with that deliberate act of your will. And I'm just telling you that because it's the truth. And so don't expect just because you make a decision to forgive whether they ask for it or not. It doesn't depend on whether they ask for it. I mean, where you say, I'm going to forgive that because that's eating me up. That's making me unhappy. That's killing me. And so, God, I got to let this thing go, and I'm, and I, and I'm making an act of my will, and I'm making a deliberate choice to let this stuff go, and I'm not going to try to get revenge, and I'm not going to plan and plot, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to strategize and keep holding on to it. I'm going to let it go. And then, you know, a week from now, you find yourself still, in, you know, mad about something that your emotions are still, you know, upset about it. I'm just telling you that it's going to take time for that emotional part of forgiveness to catch up with your, the, the act of your will. But you got to start there. And I'm going to tell you one other thing about forgiveness. It doesn't mean forgetting either. I know people, I know people says, well, I can forgive, but I hadn't forgotten. Well, who told you you were supposed to forget? You don't find that in the Bible. You know why? Because it's impossible. You can't forget that. God didn't ask you to forget it. He said, give it to them in spite of the fact that you remember it. Remembering it and being able to forgive it is an act of grace. That's why you need the grace of God. The mercy of God. Because whether they deserve it or not, whether they've asked for it or not, God says you need to do it because of what it's doing to you. And when you make a commitment to do this, don't think that you're going to forget about it. Because if you could forget about it then you, and act as if it was never there, it wouldn't be an act of grace. It would just be simply you couldn't remember it anymore. Do you know that God is the only being in the, in the universe, the world, however you want to describe it, the everything of life, that God is the only one that can choose to forget something and forget it? Amen. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, the Bible says that God chooses to forgive, to forget sins that have been confessed to him. That when you stand before God one day and you say, God, you remember this sin? I mean, he's going to say, uh, nope. Uh, what sin are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In other words, God, according to Bertha Smith, an old saint of God, she used to describe it this way. She said, God takes our sin when we ask him to forgive us, when we come clean before God, that God takes our sin and throws it into the ocean of forgetfulness and posts a no fishing sign, and it'll never be brought up against us again. God, you remember that? I think you remember that sin I did last year? Uh, he's going to go, uh, no, uh, what sin are you talking about? 
So God can forget anything he chooses to forget, and he chooses to forget confessed sin, and it's never brought up again, but you can't do that because you are a human being, and you can't let go of things like that. So don't rehearse it. Don't repress it. Don't resent it because God doesn't give you that choice. Let me read you one little thing, and I'm going I'm to read it real quick because it came from, uh, Pastor Tanya wrote this, and this is just so profound. She wrote it, and it's in a, Tanya, I, I know a lot of you guys aren't aware that she's got a whole group of writings called Streamline, and, and I mean, it's a, it's thir- how many of them, 50? Is it more than 50? Yeah. It's about 50. It's like, I mean, they're just tremendous Tremendous insights from God. Let me just, and this is just a little peck of one about forgiveness. Listen to this. This is what she wrote. With every journey of healing and forgiveness that I've taken, my belief has only intensified that forgiveness is more about a personal choice of our will than a state of our emotions. We make the choice to forgive, therefore we refrain from physical and emotional retaliation, and we pray that we're able to release that individual from the debt they owe for the pain they caused. Forgiveness is a choice to submit our will to God's will and then to allow that to affect our actions toward that person. But what about our feelings? Well, that takes more than a choice. Listen to this statement. This is one of the most profound statements I've I've ever heard about, about forgiveness. Listen to this. It takes more than a choice. There's a distance between pain and peace. All right? There's a distance between pain, that's what I have, and peace, that's what I want. A distance that only time and what God does in your life can travel. Did you get that? There's a, there's a distance between pain and peace and only time and God's work in your life can span across that, that distance. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're forgiving, you have an emotional part of that forgiveness that only time and what God is doing in your life is going to be able to carry you from pain to peace. How comforting, she goes on to write, how comforting to know that God takes us along in stages patiently working and moving us closer and closer to our destiny and further away from the hurt that put us there. Every time we gain another level of understanding concerning his work and the experience, listen to this, it paves the way for us to go to another level of release in regard to our anger and our hurt. The more our eyes are open to God's blessing in in it all, the more our pain over it all fades. Let me challenge you to make the choice quickly to forgive because God commands it. But don't fall into the enemy's trap of self-condemnation because you continue to struggle emotionally. Remember, there's a distance between pain and peace, a distance only time and God's work in you can travel. One day very soon, you'll not only be grateful for the place You'll be grateful for the path that you and God had to travel to get there. Woo! Man, that's amazing. Yeah, glory to God. I'm telling you. I'll tell you what I'll do next week. I'll bring that article. and uh, That's just a little little clip out of it, you know. Boy, it's got the most tremendous theology on Joseph and forgiving his brothers, you know, when when they came to him in Egypt after they had sold him away and... It's the most amazing theology I've ever heard. Never heard anybody translate it this way, and it's just whew, wonderful. And I'm going to steal it and preach on it, you know. So, 
I'm going to say, yeah. And then when, she, when I'm through you on the way home, she'll say, boy, that was good. Where did you ever get that? You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. I say, the Lord gave it to me. <laughs> Man, resentment just eats you up. It's like a cancer. It's like, a, it's like an acid. On the, and it kills you from the inside out. Resentment is like an acid that does more damage in the container in which it's stored than upon the victim on which it's poured. It hurts you way more than it's going to hurt anybody else when you pour it up. So don't repress it. Don't rehearse it. Don't resent it. What do you do? You release it to God. Well, what does that mean? It means this. It means what Romans 12 says, Beloved, don't avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. What does that verse say? Give your wrath to the Lord. What does that imply? You're going to have some wrath, right? <laughs> God's not, God, God's, God doesn't, not an ostrich that sticks his head in the sand and pretends like uh, you don't, you're not going to have some wrath. You know what wrath is, right? Wrath is the outward expression of anger. In the book of Ephesians, when it says, you parents don't force your children to wrath, what that means is when you discipline them, don't keep disciplining them in a way that it brings out an outward explosion of anger. Yeah. Like when they go in their room and bam, slam the door. That's wrath. When they back out of the driveway, throwing, you know, that's wrath. That is an expression, an outward expression of anger on the inside. And the Bible says, parents, don't. Don't, don't force your children to that. If, hey, look, if, 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 if they're doing something, you're going to have to find a way to discipline it. And if it, if it forces them to that point right there, whatever you're doing, it's not working. Do something else. Right. What's the definition of insanity? Keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. Yep. No, no, no. No, find out what you need to do. There's something you can, I'm telling you, when Justin and Amy were 16 years old, Justin, big as he is now, pretty much, and I got that paddle, and I, you know, light him up with it. And, uh, and then one day, I looked at him, and I said, Son, you way too big for this. <laughs> I said, This is ridiculous. And so I started taking his car away and started taking, I mean, thank the Lord they didn't have cell phones back then. But I'd take the car away. I wouldn't let them have phone calls. They'd get grounded, so to speak. You know, I've had times when Justin looked at me and said, Dad, can I have a whipping? Will you spank me, <laughs> you know, and give me, back my, give me back my stuff? I thought, hot dog, I found it. I found, found what it is now that I can use. <laughs> but anyway, the point is uh, you release it by, by, by these things. And most of the hurt that we receive in life is out of our control anyway. I mean, we can't control it. So I'm going to ask you, who's better at making sure this stuff goes away? You are the Lord. I mean, you can't control it, but God can. So if we let him have it, he can do something about it. That's what that verse says. God says, let me handle it. And that's a choice that you make. Quit trying to do it yourself and let me have it because I can do a better job than you did at it. Just find some constructive way to uh, let your anger go. Like, hmm. A lot of people have done lately with all kinds of things, with these shootings and these uh, school shootings and these other things and these uh, like uh, like uh, one of the classic ways is is mad M A D D you know mothers against drunk driving, mothers against drunk driving is a, a group that formed because all these all these mamas had babies that got killed in these automobile accidents because somebody was driving drunk. Well. What did they do with that anger? They used that anger constructively rather than destructively. Rather than chasing them down and shooting them, you know, they said, let's, let's do what we can to keep drunk drivers off the road. And so now they have a group that they form that tries to get all the drunks off the road while they're that way so that other people's innocent babies won't have to die at the hands of somebody that ought not be driving to start with. Now, that's a constructive way to use your anger so, we, you know, we, we, we realize that God knows what's going on and we, we, we know what's, we, we're reminded that God is with you. We're, we give this hurt to God and then this one little last thing, this is the third state, uh, step, rely on God's resources. 
So, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that God is with me because sometimes in hurt you forget. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give my hurt to him because he can do something with it. I can't do anything. And, 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 and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on, on the resources that God gives me. Now, let me just give these two to you very quickly. You know, this verse says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, how is God going to comfort them? Now, I want you to listen to this very, very easily and very, very quickly. Um, how can I be happy in the midst of my trials and tragedies in life? How can I receive the comfort of God? I mean, how have you tried to receive comfort? Have you, have you, you've tried in lots of ways, right? Most of us have tried to relieve our own discomfort. But we've used, and we've used basically the same thing Solomon used, you know, drugs and wine and sex and amusement and, and learning and, you know, I mean, that whole list of stuff that Ecclesiastes says is vanity and vanity and all is vanity. We've tried really anything we thought might give us a little relief from the, from the pain and the anxiety and the stress that we feel in our life. The only problem is, None of those things help for very long. They, stay, they, they, they help to start with, you know, but, but it just doesn't last very long. And there's a law out here that I'm not sure everybody's aware of or familiar with. It's called the law of diminishing returns. And the law of diminishing returns says whatever it takes to get you high today, it's going to take more of it tomorrow because the returns are going to diminish over time. So you got a little pop off of a few swigs to start with. By six months from now, it's going to take half a bottle to get that same little buzz you got. <laughs> then a year from now, it's going to take almost all the bottle to get the little buzz, and you're just going to get deeper and deeper. And before you know it, you're addicted. And now what you thought was your answer has become even a bigger problem than what you had to start with. Same way with drugs, same thing, same way with sex. Anything that is not godly is going to have diminishing returns in it. You can't get too much Jesus. I'm going to just tell you that. You can't overdose on Jesus. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't diminish as he goes. So he's given us, God's given us some tools. And what are they? And I, let me just quickly hit them. Uh, there, God's Word is a tool. And, and, and commentators tell us that there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. 7,000. So you could take your little highlighter, and as you read the Word of God, and you could take that little highlighter, and every time you come to a promise, you highlight it, and you say, man, if I, when I'm feeling this way, I need to look at this. Now, if you don't want to do that, there are probably 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 books and little daily devotionals and everything else that have already been written that, ha that contain the promises of God, and you can just look up what kind of promise you need, and it's already there. I mean, there's some, there are tools, is what I'm telling you, that, and that the Word of God is a tool in, in your life. I love in Psalm 119 what David said. Look at verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Would you say he's down? Ooh, how, how much lower could you get than your, than your soul clinging to the dust? That's, that's, that's completely down, right? That's completely discouraged. David said, man, I am completely discouraged. Revive me by uh, some entertainment. No, no. Revive me by a new TV show. Revive me by uh, a new restaurant. No, it's revive me by what? Your word. David said, it's your word that matters in my life. Look at verse 52 of that same chapter. I remembered your word and comforted myself yeah, with it. Yeah. It's God's word. I mean, why are you here today? Why do you come out here every Sunday? Because something about the word of God comforts you. You're looking for comfort. You're looking for encouragement. You're looking for something that might connect and make a difference in your life. You're wanting God to do something or say something or be something. And what am I going to do? Preach out of the latest Psychology Today magazine or, or the latest you know, book clubs of the year? No, 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 no. No, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take the Word of God and I'm going to try to open the Word of God and let the Word of God speak to your life to change you. It is the Word of God that changes our life. 
Yeah, so you know, you say, how am I going to get over it? Well, the Word of God is a resource in your life if we'll use it. His people, God's people, are a resource that we can use in our life, that God sends us in, 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 into, 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 into life. I've heard folks say, man, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need anybody. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not good. You think you don't need anybody. I know sometimes, and I've said it before to people in here, I say, I know some of you are trying to hide. I mean, you, you sit on the back, you get in isolated spots. I mean, it's hard to find one now, but, but you get, you know, you get away because you don't really want people to know who you are, and you certainly don't want to talk to anybody and, and share with anybody in your life what's going on because you, you're hiding. Well, let me just tell you this. If you keep coming and God keeps doing in you what he needs to do, which I believe he will, there will come a time where you don't want to hide anymore. As a matter of fact, you'll be looking for people to grab onto you and tack onto you because you'll, you'll have a whole change of heart because we do need each other. Look at your neighbor and say, I need you. I need you yeah. 51 times in the New Testament, the phrase one another is used. Pray for one another, care for one another, confess to one another, serve one another, have peace with one another, bear one another's burdens, love one another, submit to one another, be members one of another, comfort one another, be kindly affectionate to each other, exhort one another, edify one another, have compassion for one another, receive one another, be hospitable to one another, admonish one another, minister to one another, greet one another, fellowship with one another, wait for one another. Whew. Fact is, we need each other. We are not made to be isolated from each other. God put us together so we could support each other. Like, like 2 Corinthians, look at this. Blessed be the, be, God, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, it means uh, two things. God, if, if you're going through something bad, somebody else has been there. <laughs> In a crowd this big, there are lots of people that have been through the same thing you're going through. I guarantee you they have. And if they knew it, they could help you. They could bless you. They could encourage you if they, if, if they knew it. So you've got to get somewhere where you, can, where you can talk about it so that people can know about it and so they can say, man, brother, listen, I'm telling you, that, I, I, know, I know how that feels because I was right there. And, and let me just tell you what God said to me. And then he can bless you in life. Because what that's, the second thing that says is, if you're not hurting right now, can you remember when you were hurting? Okay, what did God say to you when you were hurting? Because whatever he said to you when you were hurting, you're obligated to tell somebody else is hurting so that God can use what he said to you to help them just like it helped you. And we can get over this thing together. Now, I'm going to tell you, that group on Wednesday night up there, I'm serious. That is the strangest group you have ever seen in your entire life. It is, it, it is the most collective group of, what would we call it? I don't know. Just diversity. I mean, just, we are, we, that's a crazy, I mean, that, when I say crazy, I don't want it to convey that these people are dumb. No, I'm just saying it's just such a unique group. You can come up there and tell them anything. Has anybody heard anybody? I mean, all right, let me just ask you this. Do any of you know who comes up there on Wednesday night? I mean, like right now sitting in this service, could you pick out 10 or 12 of them? I mean, I can because I'm there every time. And I heard somebody say, mm -hmm. yeah, us because you're there. What I'm saying is, have you heard any of them talking about somebody else's life? And boy, you should have heard this. Whew, I would have never imagined that in my whole life about this. Yeah. Man, yeah, you, no, you know why? It's because God's in it. It's because God's in it. And yet it ministers. And I guarantee you, we got people up there with deep hurt. We got people that are still on the borderline. <laughs> you know, their case is still open. But God's use in that group. Why? Because they've exposed to that group what the pains are, what the problems are. And the Holy Spirit's worked in there. And now they're being ministered to. That's God's people. So God help, God's people help you get over it. God's word help you get over it. And then the last one, and I, I'm just going to say it, God's spirit, God's Holy Spirit helps you get over it. You remember when Jesus left this earth? When Jesus left this earth in John 14 and 15, he said, all right, I'm going away. 
And, 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 I'm not, and when I go away, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He said, I'm going to send another comforter, just like me. A parakletos is the Greek word, which means uh, just like me. It doesn't mean a substitute for me. It means somebody just like me with the same nature, same purpose, same everything, just like me. Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send another comforter, and he's going to even be better than me because he's going to live in you. He's going to be with you. He's going to live in you. And, and when he went away, he sent the Holy Spirit back and once you've received Christ, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. God lives on the inside of you. And what does the Holy Spirit do in you? It makes you a religious kook or something? No. no. The Holy Spirit uh, comforts you, strengthens you, challenges you, walks with you, ministers to you, matures you, and lives with you, and walks with you, and Brings you to the right place at the right time. Lets you hear things. You know, I mean, it's just amazing what the Holy Spirit. So you have some resources if you'll use them. Yeah, God's Word. Come on, man. Keep, keep coming. Keep get at, get in there on your own. Some, you know, get your little book and read some promises if you need them, and and let God speak to you through that, and then. Come and get in a get in some of men's night, man. Our men's night, we got the most open group uh, group of men I've ever seen in my life. Those guys tell stuff embarrassing me. I'm going, my lord, brother, you know. And they don't care. They don't even blink an eye. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Do you know this is a church group? And I and and the only reason I say that is because. Uh, I've been in charge. Listen, I've been in, I've been in ministry 45 years. I, I've been involved in all kinds of church stuff, and I'm telling you, I've never heard stuff like I hear at men's night. I mean, not that it surprises me. You know, I mean, it's, it's nothing I hadn't heard before, but it surprises me because somebody's saying it, you know. And but but it helps. It helps. It releases. It gets. I mean, it, it, it's ministry. It just. I mean, because listen, people that are hurting don't necessarily need an answer. It's not like you have all the answers. It, it, I've noticed that people that are hurting, they, they, don't need, uh, they don't need advice as much as they just need somebody to hear what they're saying and sympathize and empathize with them in some way and listen and say, brother, I, I got you, man. Let me pray for you. Come over here, buddy. Let me, let me just, let me, let me, come on. Come on, let me, let me, God, bless this brother. You know, and I mean, that, that's what you need when you're hurting. And God will give you some answers out of all that kind of stuff. So anyway, there you go. Blessed are you when you mourn.